Hi there, Caroline Lewis here. It's a thrill when I get to meet podcast listeners and realize that we are connected through the Sermon Brainwave podcast. Some tell me they feel like they are active participants in our discussions that Joy, Matt, Rolf, and I have around biblical texts. Or if you're a narrative lectionary podcast listener, those conversations that Rolf, Craig, and Catherine have around the narrative texts. It's a reminder that all of us who preach are partners in this great calling to declare the good news, especially during difficult times. And here we are in the final week of the Working Preacher Spring Fund campaign. We are getting close to meeting our $50,000 goal. If you or a preacher you know relies on Working Preacher, now is the time to give your financial support. Thank you, thank you, more than ever, for your support for this ministry. Go to workingpreacher.org slash donate and give today to help keep Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The texts for the day of Pentecost, May 31, 2020, are from Acts chapter 2, 1 through 21. The psalm is Psalm 104, 24 through 34 and 35b. The second reading is 1 Corinthians 12, 3b through 13, and John chapter 20, 19 through 23. So one thing that is interesting about uh, the Gospel of John is that it is the, it's the Gospel that comes out for these high holy days or these festival days. And so the readings uh, for the, the Gospel readings for Pentecost are always sections uh, on John from different portions of, of John's portrayal of the spirit, which we talk about every year is a very different kind of presentation of pneumatology than we get in Acts 2, for example, or even in 1 Corinthians. And so the way in which we enter into Pentecost, uh, I think really has a, a pastoral sensitivity. It always should, but particularly this year of how do we imagine the role of the spirit in these times? Uh, what kind of spirit, if you will, do your people need to hear about this, this Sunday? Uh, what, what is it? What are the promises of the spirit that you think will really uh, touch them, uh, land on them, every pun intended, uh, to in terms of uh, what 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 do they really need to hear about the spirit's presence, the spirit's activity? Uh, we have a lot of choices here, uh, and and so that that becomes something that's an I think an important question uh, always for the preacher, but particularly this year uh, when uh, in the, the time of a pandemic, what what's the what's the particular promise of the spirit that your people need to hear? Well, what are our choices? Well, uh, you would you have... say it's, you want to hear John this year? Let's take a look at each one. Yeah. So, yeah, that's Let's that's start a great with John. Idea. Let's start with John. So, uh, a, a couple of things with the John text uh, that I uh, that I was landing on this year, and the first is uh, John twenty verse twenty. Uh, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And that's a, that's a promise here, a, a, a fulfillment of a promise that Jesus has made back in chapter 16. And, you know, we, we, we tend to, we've heard this passage with Thomas. And so uh, we, there are, I think there are a lot of other foci when it comes to this text. Peace, as the Father has sent me, giving of the Holy Spirit, and uh, verse 23. But I think, uh, I'm not sure how often we land on, uh, and the disciples rejoiced. But it is a fulfillment of promise, because back in chapter 16, 
verses 20 and 22, 20 through 22. Very, and, and this really rings true for me uh, this year. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. And then he uses the metaphor, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. So that's where I would go uh, this year of that, uh, this rejoicing is it, this response of the gospels of rejoicing is is exactly because Jesus has fulfilled the promise um, from the from the farewell discourse, my, and my, and so, hmm? but, but uh, is that does that have anything to do with the spirit yet? I mean, um, is that the spirit's work? In what way is that the spirit's work in this text? Yeah, that's a great question. I think. Uh, it, because in part, what the whole development of the spirit in the gospel of John is the one who is another paraclete who will, uh, you know, the another advocate who will carry on Jesus' presence. And so it's, uh, it, it, I think to do a, a connection with recognizing that the promise that Jesus makes is that Jesus will be, Jesus will see them again. And then now, and then with the giving of the spirit that will even continue even, even further. And so, uh, but that, that, that the presence of the spirit, the presence of Jesus is this, uh, is this promise of, of, of joy uh, and rejoicing. Uh, and, and so not only does Jesus make good on that promise, of, of rejoicing, but then also makes good on the promise of the sending of the spirit, which has been all throughout the farewell discourse. And so I, I think it's important. I think it would be an, uh, a meaningful connection to say that this is, uh, that this presence of Jesus and the presence of the spirit is cause for rejoicing. And in my own journey uh, this year, uh, the uh, idea of forgiving is uh, uh, weighs heavy. And um, Jesus breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Um, but that, that second part weighs on me in terms of if you don't forgive, for me, this has been true. I can't rejoice. When I hold on to... Um, uh, wanting revenge, when I hold on to wanting to get even, when I hold on to wanting to do to those who did, uh, to do that to those what they did to me that caused me pain, um, I can't rejoice. And that the forgiveness is not for them as, it, as much as it is for me to be able to say, I can move on from the harm that you've caused me because I'm not going to let you to continue to harm me. And then I can look forward um, and, and by God's spirit, not, not by my own, but by God's spirit, I can look forward to see what promises God is keeping yet. That's helpful. I, I, I think, you know, we had in the Ascension uh, Day texts uh, at the end of Luke that, um, that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to the nations as part of the mission. And not every book in the New Testament talks about forgiveness. Um, in fact, some of them where you expect it to be, it isn't, uh, which is interesting to note. But one of the things that the New Testament seems fairly um, strong about is that the forgiveness of sins in some way um, is a part of the work that uh, Christ or God accomplished through Christ's death and resurrection. Sometimes I think, uh, like you're pointing out, Joy, um, we need to just be really practical about it. Um, as families have been um, locked down together, we know that uh, tempers get short and uh, just the really practical nature of uh, being able to forgive those who are closest to you on a daily basis uh, is a sort of really, really practical Christian life skill. Not saying that, uh, I'm, I'm saying that for a friend, of course, uh, not for me. Of course. 
Well, I think too, I, I think that, uh, yeah, that th those are really um, critical points here. When you think about the ways in which these uh, theological categories that we're used to, how they are, how they are experienced and heard differently uh, in, the, in, in what we're going through now. I want to also kind of pull that back a little bit to say uh, that with John, this, this idea of forgiveness of sins also has a very uh, significant particularity in that um, not because sin in the Gospel of John is not recognizing or embracing the revelation of God in Jesus. And, uh, and it's not a pet, it's not a, it's not acts of uh, of of immorality or or uh, but it's it has this larger and it's actually this larger category of preventing people from being in relationship with Jesus and I think that could that could be uh, something that we might want to pursue homiletically. Uh, Gail O'Day writes uh, in uh, her one of her commentaries on this passage. Forgiveness of sins is the community's spirit-empowered mission to continue Jesus' work of making God known in the world, and through that work to bring the world to judgment and decision through its response to Jesus. And so it's an, also it's an opportunity for a pastoral homiletical opportunity to, uh, to expand our understanding of what forgiveness means. Uh, and, and I think that 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 would be another direction that you could go and it's and it, and that 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 forgiveness or lack thereof uh is uh it, or the forgiveness piece of it is possible with the spirit's presence and that's that's the connection that's made here what kind of spirit do you see uh matt in the x text I see. <laughs> uh, I see a spirit that's um, that's the spirit of Jesus that's uh, that's poured out now in a um, in a in a new way. I see a spirit that is, in some ways, echoing the the Joel prophecy that's that's universal without regard for uh, the things that we use to distinguish ourselves from each other or to rank ourselves in relation to each other. I see a spirit that is bringing together a multi-ethnic community of Jews and proselytes from different nations who speak different languages, eat different kinds of food, dress differently, et cetera, et cetera, um, and speaks to them in a voice they already know, in a language they already know. And then I see a spirit who at the very end of Acts 2 creates a community. So that's uh, easy to miss because it's a long chapter, but Pente the Pentecost story does not conclude until we get a glimpse into the daily life of the church in Jerusalem, which is marked by both uh, life and fellowship and worship in the home and out in public. And it involves prayer, it involves generosity and service, it involves teaching and learning. And it's also, then I'll shut up, uh, a spirit that has come in response to a promise and to a commission or a charge. Uh, the promise was power. The promise was uh, Christ's own presence, I believe. And the charge was to be my witnesses. So it's all those things. But before it, people can be witnesses, they are made into a new community with a distinctive uh, ethos and practice. I really like that's all I got. That's it. I like it. I really like Deborah Mumford's uh, commentary, I, particularly the first line. I mean, the promise of the Holy Spirit compelled 120 people to gather in anticipation of it. Uh, they rearranged their schedules and synchronized their calendars to make themselves available to God. And then she has four more the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so I would just draw people to that commentary too of that specificity of what the of what the spirit is able to do uh in terms of of synchronizing calendars to this larger sort of uh, mission of the church but um I, I particularly love that first one that made sort of made time work <laughs> uh 
uh, the spirit works in that, that making time, making time happen that the spirit arrives. So I love that. What we have to do uh, in our, our trying to meet up now is to make time work. Um, I, I have to be attentive if I'm going to gather with several different people uh, through uh, my uh, a live uh, stream. And so we've got a schedule and for a variety of folks to make themselves available. Um, I, I, I'm always struck by the fact, one of my students pointed out that uh, Pentecost is the third festival of our remembrance. So we know Christmas and Easter better than we know um, the th whole story of Pentecost. And that story of Pentecost begins with the festival that was gathering um, before it became what we call the birthday of the church. And that we're stuck, gathered at home right now. And to use this, these words of, of, uh, of Deborah, that we have to make this time work, we have to reschedule in order to be together. And then in that way, we can from this place, our home, be gathered in a dispersed community of every nation, every, uh, every uh, category, every status. Um, there's an equaling to the way we are dispersed now that brings together a powerful community when we gather virtually. How about the Psalm, Rolf? What's the spirit in the Psalm? The spirit in the Psalm is the spirit of creation. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it, that might be a really timely text here uh, because of if you feel like you've been locked in. Uh, we're recording this, you know, uh, more than a month ahead of time in April. Um, so it's people have probably gotten outside yet, but I feel like I just haven't been able to get outside right now. But, but uh, the spirit of God in creation. And uh, there's a really lovely commentary uh, on the website on this text, although I disagree, I have a point of disagreement uh, with the text, which I think I'll talk about. Um, but so you get, you know, you get this uh, incredible uh, part towards the end of the psalm, which is the, the, the first of all, you get the prayer in it, right? Um, These all look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather up. When you open your hand, they're filled with good things, you know? Um, but then you get this powerful, um, reference to the spirit. When you hide your face, they're dismayed. When you take away their breath, that is their ruach in Hebrew, they die and return to the dust. But when you spend, uh, but when you send forth your spirit, that is your ruach, they are created, uh, maybe recreated as a better translation, and you renew the face of the ground. So, uh, so you've got uh, the picture of God's spirit um, is the spirit of creation and say sustaining creation and recreation, and this may be uh, this may be an early reference even to resurrection. Um, it's uh, along with Isaiah 25. It's uh, maybe the places in the Old Testament uh, that are talking about uh, about resurrection. Uh, so it's it's the you know it's a uh, it's the spirit of creation and. I remember hearing a great sermon on this um, text by the uh, Bishop Dave Zelmer of, of South Dakota, and he talked about being taken out into the um, middle of the cornfield in the hot summer night of July by his grandpa, and then just saying, lay down and lay down. And they lay down, and when the corn is growing fast in summer, you can hear it growing at night. You can hear the, the, the cells popping and dividing uh, and uh, that sense of the, that the, the creation teams with life because God's spirit, God's spirit sustains it. All right, I said I disagree with the, the um, commentary at one point, uh, so I might as well mention it. It says in verse 26 uh, that on the, on the sea, there goes Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. That's actually a bad translation. What it should say is there goes Leviathan that you formed to enjoy him, to laugh at him, literally. Uh, there's a, a direct parallel in um, Job that proves that reading, that God takes joy, but the point is God takes joy in creation. God takes joy in you. 
if God can look at the great Leviathan chaos beast and laugh and take delight, well, that means God delights even more in you, which I think is a wonderful, really a wonderful notion. I, I think too that I, I, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot, Rolf, because uh, so much too, uh, we just came off of the Festival of Homiletics a couple, you know, it'll be a couple weeks after, uh, this will be a couple weeks after that. And the focus was on uh, preaching the whole earth, climate and creation. And there's been so much conversation uh, with uh, the coronavirus and, uh, and, and the connection between that and climate change and creation. And so it's an opportunity too for people to, for, for you to think about with people, uh, God's investment in creation. Uh, and that, that when, we, when we think about a pandemic like this, it's, uh, it's, it, the, it's, it affects the whole world, right? The cosmos, that, that all of creation is affected by this. And so it's, it's, uh, it, it's a way to remind ourselves of God's, um, God's spirit in all of it. And that's really what's at stake when we think about the role of the spirit and uh, particularly in creation. So I think that would be, I think that'd be worthwhile. And par par paralleling with that, if um, um, when we were talking earlier, you were saying that uh, uh, um, the sin in John is what prevents us from knowing God. Um, if the creation, as the psalmist would say, declares uh, the glory of God, then our task in our places around the world um, who have become witnesses in acts um, with the spirit uh, descending to every nation, every tongue and every tribe, our way of living is to make God known from not just in our individual lives, uh, but in the very creation in which God delights. I love that. Thanks, thanks for that. 1 Corinthians 12 is some of Paul's most important writing on the spirit, the work of the spirit in the community. We've got a great commentary on the website by Brian Peterson. I really appreciate how he reiterates that there's a difference between spiritual gifts and talents that we might have. And that it's, it's wrong to equate those two things. I would add to that as well, that giftedness is not the same thing as spirituality. Uh, one can be incredibly gifted and, and lack spiritual uh, maturity or lack trustworthiness. And so for, for the preacher, for any congregation really that's trying to think about not just who are we, but what can we do and what with what gifts has God provided this community to do something to move forward? Really important for, uh, for a leader to help sort through that giftedness, to avoid the hierarchies that were just ripe for picking for Paul in his, in his day. Paul had all sorts of models where he could have drawn from to talk about why certain gifts are at the top of the hierarchy and other gifts are, are less valuable. And, for the most part in this passage, Paul refuses to do that, but instead talks about this mutually interdependent, self-supporting body that doesn't have a head that directs everything and gets all of the honor, but is fully integrated one part with another. And that's incredibly important, not just for understanding Paul well, or understanding the Holy Spirit well, but for thinking about leadership and creating a Christian community that's not just uh, efficient or well-functioning or uh, budget neutral or whatever, you know, the values for what that looks like when put into practice are, for Paul at least, a unity that reflects the unity of God.